Acclaimed opera director Graham Vick is bringing his production of Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin to Glyndebourne this summer. I wanted to look at why the story of Onegin still packs such a powerful punch and how Graham Vick sees it. Eugene Onegin is based on Pushkin's novel in verse of the same name, a book which is read by every Russian child. It's the tale of how Onegin, a young man living in St. Petersburg in the early 1800s, spurns the love of the dreamy Tatiana, but regrets his mistake when he meets her again years later, by which time she's married. Tchaikovsky wrote an opera based on the novel, which premiered in Moscow in 1879, and it's been a staple in the opera world ever since. I went down to the Opera House in Lewis to meet Graham Vick, who's reviving his 1994 production of Anyegin at Glyndebourne this summer. I watched how Graham Vick, an energetic man of 60, took rehearsals of the letter scene, in which he shows Tatiana, played by Ekaterina Shebachenko, and her nurse Filipievna, played by Irina Chistyakova, what he wants them to do. These are just two of the sparkling array of singers he's assembled for the production, which includes some of the most interesting singers around, from Russia and Ukraine, as well as soloists from Lithuania, Switzerland, Britain and America. I watch as he describes his vision to the singers with great warmth, including by removing his trainers and getting into bed in his baggy jeans and crumpled half-tucked-in shirt and being Tatiana, tossing and turning in the sheets, unable to sleep. The pain is that you're too happy, not that you're too sad, he tells Sherbachenko. You're sick with happiness. You're terrified of feeling so happy because it can't keep going, he explains. He's tactile, a hand held here, a pat on the shoulder there, and clear in his explanations. <laughs> Some see Anyagin as a tragic tale, but Vic sees it as an ordinary story. Well, obviously the appeal isn't the story, the appeal is how the story's told. That's what makes the piece fascinating. The story in itself is uh, rather banal. If you just tell it as a plot line, it's not that interesting. A boy meets girl, doesn't work out. Girl goes off, gets married, boy meets her later, thinks he wants her now and it's too late because she's married, so off he goes. I mean, no great tragedy there, no great shakes, happens to everybody, we all live on. What happens to Anyagin is not a catastrophe. Graham Vick again. Whoever died for love. People suffer over love, and that's why we use the word passion, which includes the quality of suffering, and it's part of its pleasure. It's a simple and a normal human experience. I don't think we should look at it as a tragedy. And indeed, I think you know, the, the mental health issue with which we're now obsessed, sometimes are perfectly normal experiences, are uh, over-defined as problems. I mean, to live a full and interesting life, it's going to include being hurt, being depressed... It's part of being a human being. What else do you want? Besides, God knows, these are Russians. These people know how to be depressed. I asked Vic whether what was interesting about the story is not what it tells, but how it's told. Yeah, of course. How it's told in musical terms and how Pushkin chooses to tell it. The challenge of the opera is how to try and balance up a little bit the fact that the music has not quite enough of the tone of Pushkin about it for me, and a little bit too much of a middle-aged man's sentimental response to a love story. Vladimir Yurovsky is principal conductor of the London Philharmonic Orchestra and was music director at Glyndebourne for 13 years. He says that it's important to remember that Onegin is an intimate piece. To me, Onegin is not an opera. It's exactly what Tchaikovsky calls it, it's lyric sins. In a way, it's, it's a perfect anti-opera because it's, it hasn't got any of the grand operatic features it's the most intimate of theatrical pieces written in the 19th century. Secondly, it's based upon a book which in itself defies 
any classical norms because it's a novel written in verse. It's a novel basically without a hero because Onegin being the hero of this novel is a, a perfect anti-hero and the whole story is, is told from a certain distance which Pushkin assumes. At the same time, when you look at the theatrical realization of it by Tchaikovsky, it's a story told through the prism of Tatiana Larina's view of the world and view of Onegin. In fact, it's been suggested many times that the opera should not be called Eugene Onegin, the opera should be called Tatiana Larina. It's her story in which Onegin is featured as an important, but a character in, in her story. And I think that what Tchaikovsky achieves here is almost an impossible thing, being a man, to describe the world as seen by a woman from a female point of view. So in many ways, it is an unusual piece. And it's a piece which is dealing with eternal questions of love, hate, jealousy, misunderstanding and solitude. The way in which Anyegin is written makes it easier for Russians to sing. Vladimir Yurovsky again. Onegin is mainly written in a highly colloquial, conversational Russian. And there are certain words and even certain ways of pronouncing certain words which hint at certain class of the person who is speaking it. So it's really digging deep into the history of the Russian society. And although it has become an international opera, which is played everywhere in the world, there are still nuances which are extremely hard to be reproduced when this opera is sung by people from other countries. It's the same as when you're taking an opera like Gianni Schicchi, Take any other Italian piece and you can do it without any problems with international opera stars. But take Gianni Schicchi and then you are being transplanted into this world of Florentine aristocracy. And there is the Florentine dialect, plus there are all the nuances to do with the class differences in the society. So opera directors tend to hire Russians to sing Anyagin where possible. If I'm thinking Russian opera, I would say almost any other piece by any Russian composer of the 19th century can be sung easily by people who have learned the text with the coach, with the translation book, etc., etc. Onegin stops being real for me when you can hear that there are people singing who, who actually don't speak it. And I'm not being nationalistic in that sense. I've, I've done this piece a lot with uh, non-Russian singers, also at Glyndebourne, but also this production of Graham Vick, and also when we did it at La Scala, the same very production with Graham. We had some Russians, but there were also some Italians singing. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's, it's highly difficult. So whenever people can bring in Russian speakers, they do it. Yurovsky draws a parallel between Pushkin's Anyegin and the work of another Russian writer. This is a perfectly Chekhovian piece in the sense that Chekhov created the dramaturgical world in which the people acting are very highly complex characters and none of them, not a single one, can be described as a straightforward good or a bad evil character. There aren't evil characters, there aren't simply good characters, they're all human beings, they're complex, they're problematic, and each one in their own way is unhappy. One danger in playing the character of Anyegin is that he can become unsympathetic. Graham Vick. Yeah, I think well, the traditional Russian image of Onyegin doesn't work for me. It's too remote, it's too closed, it's too external and has not enough in our life, I think. In order to tell the story well, you need to explain why Tatiana falls in love. 
So to be successful in this story, the audience have to fall in love with both Tatiana and Onyekin. Otherwise, the last scene doesn't play. David Picard, the general director of the Glyndebourne Festival, says we mustn't see Onyekin as a cartoonish baddie. It's easy to sort of laugh at Onyekin and say, what are you doing treating this, this girl so appallingly? But we're watching him from the outside. We're not thinking about ourselves in that situation. And I think it's terribly important that Onyegin doesn't become a sort of villain of the piece where we get to the end of the opera and we think, yes, you've got your comeuppance, that's good. We should feel absolutely heartbroken about both of them at the end. And a really fine Onyegin performance shows Onyegin, I think, as a completely rounded but fundamentally flawed character, as we all are in real life. <laughs> Anyegin is played by Ukrainian baritone Andrei Bondarenko, who trained in Kiev and St. Petersburg. Graham Vick says Bondarenko is the best Anyegin around now and will be the best for the next 20 years. <laughs> David Picard again. It's got such a wonderful elegance to the sound, and he's also a very complete performer. He's a, he's a fine actor, and we're all in the opera world looking not just for wonderful voices, but good actors. The sort of elegance of his singing is so absolutely perfect for the role of Onyegin. This sort of rather aristocratic sound that he makes feels absolutely right for this piece. And of course, it's wonderful that, uh, that he speaks the language, and that's terribly important to have a Russian singer in that role. Andrei Bondarenko himself says Onyegin is a tough role. I think actually Onyegin is the most difficult character, like a role, in all Russian music. Because, especially in the first half, Tchaikovsky wrote amazingly beautiful music, but it's really hard to, to show Onyegin without any passion inside of him in the first part of the opera. It's always difficult to stay to stay not really with passion on stage. You always want to show something like that you can sing emotion, 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 emotion. Opera, it's emotion, right? And the first half in the Negin, you cannot do it. You need to be really straight about your singing, about your mind, what is really difficult. Andrei Bondarenko says it's hard to play Onyegin as a very cold character. I don't like this word cold, actually, because it's so traditional thing in Russia, for example, to say, like all directors say, you need to be cold. But uh, it's not possible to be, <laughs> to be cold in opera anyway, especially to act cold person. But uh, I don't think Onyegin is cold. Onyegin is just like absolutely... He's tired about what he did already. He's tired of life. I'm 22, can you imagine? <laughs> Working with Russian soloists on Eugene Yonyegin is appealing partly because of their attitude, says Graham Vick. Look, I love working with Russian singers. One of the reasons is their enormous seriousness. They want it to matter. They want it to be important. Nor do I wish people to feel uncomfortable. So I, would, I try not to put people in a situation that they don't feel convincing in. But uh, by and large, you know, Russian artists like myself think it matters, think it is important. And that's the only reason I do what I do, because I want it to speak. I want it to matter. Ekaterina Sergeeva, who sings the part of Olga, Tatiana's younger sister in the opera, and described by Vickers just like a movie star, is a soloist from the Marinsky Theatre in St. Petersburg. Vick encouraged her to bring more playfulness to the part. Here, Graham saw in me, for some reason, a funny young girl for whom love is a game. Graham is amazing because he sees the sides of a person that they may not show in their life, but which are there all the same. He accesses these aspects. For example, I may be a bit gloomy in real life, but he can see that if I feel relaxed, then I will reveal myself. He says to me all the time, play her as you like, do as you please. So it's fun, easy. This was hard to do at first. 
At the first rehearsal, my whole being felt as if I was in opposition to what was happening, because I was used to performing the role in my own way. But after one rehearsal, I managed to see what he sees in this character. I was able to show another side of her. Olga is perhaps rather spoiled, but the music brings out beauty even in her character, according to conductor Vladimir Yurovsky. I find it this is the, the least sympathetic character in the piece, but then of course there is this beautiful aria. The power of music is such that even the most shallow, the most uninteresting or despicable character is becoming three-dimensional and really sympathetic. So Olga's aria is such an example because it gives a portrait of a young girl who is open to the life, who is only expecting happiness and joys and pleasures from this life, who is refusing to see the, the darker side. So it's a very light, youthful character. And behind this music, you you stop seeing the highly egotistical nature, which unfortunately comes to full bloom in the following scenes. Vladimir Yurovsky. Ekaterina Sergeva says she feels relaxed working with director Graham Vick. He is a very genuine person, and he makes you take the shape of the character, not by force, but simply through his emotions, his work, his energy. This is a great gift, to get you interested and to help you find new sides to the character, so that the character becomes a memorable one for the audience. Vic's commitment elicits respect among the singers. Ekaterina Sergeyeva again. His observations are very interesting. So is his interest in the characters. He really loves his work and this is very appealing. You want to give him back as much as he gives to you. This really shows on stage and in rehearsals. You don't think, how shall I sing? You just perform and you revel in it. Andrei Bondarenko says Vic takes his cues from the music and not just the text. Graham, I think the first director I have ever met who is just really, really going to full score. You know, in the opera you have the vocal score, when the voice line and piano, and full score is like all orchestra. His directing is from full score. Because a lot of directors, they just do the words story. And Graham, he tried to take all of emotions and feelings from the Tchaikovsky music. Kleinborn director David Picard says that Vic's staging of Anyegin is distinguished by the director's ability to tell a story in a way in which the audience finds it easy to connect with every character. The other particular feature of this production is its dance sequences. The polonaise, the waltz, the mazurka. David Picard. One of the things I love doing when people come and see our production is ask them how many dancers they think are in the production. People who are, who are just dancers and they say, oh well clearly there were about 50 dancers in this production. Well, there are actually only a handful of professional dancers in it, but the majority of the dancing is done by members of our chorus. And one of the reasons why we put it on at the beginning of the summer is because it requires a huge amount of rehearsal time because they have to learn fantastically complicated dance movements. The crowd scenes in the piece are so beautifully observed and so minutely detailed, even down to little children hiding under the table in the middle of the dancing scene is a little mental picture that I have of the production straight away. It's a production that is teeming with life and teeming with character. Much of Graham Vick's recent work has been highly politicised, such as Havansky Gate, a version of Mussorgsky's Havanchina, which he's just staged with the Birmingham Opera Company, or another Mussorgsky creation, Boris Godunov, which he directed with the Marinsky Theatre in St. Petersburg in 2012. His staging of Anyegin, however, is not political. This is partly because Tchaikovsky was not interested in those sorts of questions. Graham Vick. 
Wozowski was, by his very nature, a political man with an enormous amount to say about society, about humanity, about the construction of who we are. Tchaikovsky was not interested in any of those issues. And he was a great artist, I don't mean to diminish him by that, but that wasn't his agenda. It was Mussorgsky's agenda. So, of course, if you approach Mussorgsky, it, by definition, it has to be political. And if you want it to be politically alive, then you have to address it. And Yegin's nothing to do with that. It's, it's a sentimental, touching drama about people's hearts and emotional lives, about class, about manners. And so from that point of view, it's a different kind of a challenge. Yeah, I'm sh- look, I'm sure if I did a new production of Onyegin now, it wouldn't be this one. It's also not political, because when Vic directed Onyegin at Glyndebourne in 1994, he was trying to see if he could produce mature and nuanced work through productions with traditional visual values something he's moved away from since. Does the sheer beauty of operatic sets and costumes become a barrier to understanding? Graham Vick. Oh, God, yes, I think it happens all the time, especially here at Glyndebourne, where, where part of the idea is to be in the middle of beauty, is to have a lovely picnic, is to dress up well, and is to have a miraculous experience for your evening. And so the opera is a part of a beautiful, enchanting evening. It's a kind of fairy tale evening. So I think it's a, it's a great danger. On the other hand, this is a kind of perfect place to understand the values of Onyekin, to understand the ease and leisure of the first scene, to understand the, the smallness and provincial gossip, as well as the goodness of the country in the Larin party scene, and to understand the horrible, empty, superficial snobbishness of a first night here. All the levels are available at Glyndebourne that exist in this piece, so it's a really good piece to do here. I wondered whether the Glyndebourne audience will agree with what Vic says about snobbishness. I hope they will. I hope they will. And besides, probably because the, the British, we're really good at laughing at ourselves. It is one of our better qualities, I think. Vic says he feels comfortable at the Countryside Opera House while rehearsing. His working conditions are excellent. But will he feel the same way on opening night? I'm expecting to feel uncomfortable on the first night. That's exactly, that's the most honest answer. I don't feel remotely uncomfortable at the moment because he gives me privileged rehearsal conditions. I have a lot of time with a marvellous cast. I have the space and time to develop my own art and craft, which is incredibly valuable for me. So from that point of view, for the arts, for the profession, for that whole thing, it's a very nourishing, strong, valuable process. By the time it gets to the first night, I will wish we could share it with a lot more people. The festival is not paid for by the public, however. Graham Vick. It doesn't take the taxpayers' money. It's not paid for by everybody else. It's paid for by wealthy people. That's pretty much how the world tends to work. I'm visiting. I'm passing through to see how I feel 20 years on. Russian literature and music seem to hold an enduring appeal for Graham Vick. His next project is Prokofiev's War and Peace, the opera based on Tolstoy's novel, which opens at the Marinsky in July. He first staged War and Peace in 1991, when the Marinsky was called the Kirov. I asked him why he chose to stage this particular opera now. I'm going back because I'm, because I'm asked to, because of the challenge of doing a very great opera 20-odd years on in a new theatre for a new century and a new me, I think. So it'll be a very different from the old one. Three weeks after I did the last one, the Soviet Union crumbled. And at the moment is another time of enormous turbulence in Europe and is a very it... interesting time to address, to address an anti-war piece. As Vic himself says... A mediocre La Boheme is moving, whereas a bad Eugene Yanyigin is dull. It'll be up to the audience to decide, but somehow, dull sounds unlikely. <laughs>